Hello, CPL. We are here with Priscilla Austin, who is the pastor at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Seattle, Washington. She's had um, stints all over the place, but um, she'll, she'll talk more about it. But we're going to just talk to her a little bit more about Christian public leadership and what it means to her. So Priscilla, can you give these folks at home um, a little taste of your call narrative and how you became the Christian public leader that you are? Well, I would say my uh, my call narrative began um, years before I even recognized that it was happening. Um, when a, uh, a pastor asked me, actually the pastor told me, not taking communion. And I said, well, I had been confirmed. Growing up in the Missouri Synod, I had not um, completed confirmation and didn't realize that I had stumbled into an ELCA church, which was somehow different. And he looked at me and he said, Priscilla, you're teaching confirmation. And I said, oh, <laughs> you, can receive, you can receive communion. And, and from there it, it, it began. It began this journey of, um, of pushing me into leadership, pushing me into um, recognizing my own role, recognizing my own identity. Um, Eventually, um, after years of pursuing other things and, and fleeing the actual call that God had put on my life, um, I eventually submitted to, uh, to seminary and um, this ministry, um, moved my way into the parish where I served in a bilingual congregation down in, um, in Phoenix. My, my first week in Phoenix, um, as an intern, um, actually, when I was when I knew that I was headed there as an intern, it was one week after um, Arizona had um, put into law the um, SB 1070 um, racialized uh, policing in a way that they were allowed to uh, pick up folks for suspected immigration issues. And so um, all of a sudden, there I was, headed to Phoenix, a brown woman with very brown children, um, to a state that was declaring war on brown people. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a little scary. It was a little kind of, God, what are you doing? What is this that you have, have declared for me? Um, within a week of my arriving in Phoenix, there was a rally. And as a, as a student intern who just felt like I needed to, to understand what was going on and to be a presence um, for the faith community, um, it was an interfaith rally. I went and made my way by myself because I hadn't really met anybody down there yet. Uh, made my way to the rally and um, ended up getting interviewed by NPR because I happened to be in collar. <laughs> wow. And so, wow. so there I was. And so, I mean, I've... I, that that sort of framed my understanding of how I began to do it. That um, this wearing of a collar um, names me and identifies me and um, proclaims me as someone who speaks with some sort of authority. And how do I choose to use that? Mm -hmm. um, when I um, changed calls and came to Emmanuel in Seattle, um, my first Sunday in the pulpit was uh, the Sunday after the Charleston Nine shooting. Mm. And um, that, again, compelled me to, to, to begin my ministry in a way that I had not planned or anticipated. Mm. Um, and so in, in the most pastoral way, I, I spoke in the of my heart and uh, the justice to which God calls us. And, um, our own participation in the sins that uh, that exist, mm. and and so for me that that um, that public leadership piece is something that is very personal, um, very much inseparable mm. from from who I am and who God calls me to be. Yes. Um, it just it's it's right there. It's right there. Yeah, and I and I see that I see that in you, um, just your your ability to lead from your experience and to what I appreciate about you is that you've spent time 
uh, both away from the church and in the church, so you you really are able to articulate um, what folks are going on, you know, what's going on for folks out there in the world, in the theater world where you spent time, and, yes, in the activist yes, world, yes. and um, you're just uniquely positioned to do awesome things. Um, could you talk a little bit about, um, I, you talked some about the joys, um, maybe the joys and the struggles that you're facing, mm -hmm. maybe right now mm -hmm. without sharing too much that might incriminate someone, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, it is um, and struggle is is um, is this naming of the gospel when it feels convicting, right? Mm -hmm. um, right now, um, sort of the the dialogue that is happening among preachers is um, how do we preach in an era? where the gospel says one thing and the world is doing something completely different. Um, and people therefore, by virtue of just preaching the gospel, mm -hmm. see it as political, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, the, the lectionary texts over these last weeks since the inauguration have, it is almost as if every political activity almost was like setting up the gospel on Sunday. It, mm. it just, it was right there. And, and it is, it is a struggle um, to try and make sure that we're doing things that, uh, that, that protect our not-for-profit status and all of that, mm. but still very specifically name the gospel. Mm. Um, I, um, I am not one to shy away from that. So I am, I am blessed to be in a congregation that is, um, predominantly supportive of that voice. Um, matter of fact, has actually uh, come to me and said things like, thank you, we need to hear more. And, um, and, and also willing to say, I really didn't like what you said. It made me really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm really gonna have to struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And then followed it with thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, at the moment, in this particular point in my in my call, um, I, I see myself in a a unique and blessed position yeah. of of being in a place where I really can use my voice. I can declare my voice. I can and I can speak these things. I can speak truth to power, um, knowing that I'm not um, as many leaders of color often find themselves in, particularly in the ELCA, particularly find ourselves in positions where. To name our identity is to risk our call. Mm. Um, I'm I'm not presently in that kind of a place, and I'm I'm really feel blessed to do that. And because I have many sister and brother colleagues who are in places like that, I feel like it's necessary for me um, to make can, sure that I take advantage of that space to do say, that. Can you say what you said one more time? To name my identity is to risk my call. Identity, is, yeah, to risk so. So sometimes, you know, one can one can find oneself in a place where, if I say, as I did um, on that uh, that day in in after Charleston, that um, I'm a black woman, I am fearful for who and what and how we as ELCA are teaching and raising young white mm -hmm. men in this, mm -hmm. in this church that, that they would walk into one of our sister congregations and look at someone who looks like me and decide that I have no value and my life has no value. Um, and, and that, and saying statements like that um, can put people at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, when Tamir Rice was shot, um, I wept so deeply. Um, it was hard to not enter the pulpit that Sunday without naming, again, it was another Sunday where the gospel spoke very clearly to how we care for children. Mm. And, yeah. and I said, you know, and I spoke of Tamir Rice and, and named my 12 year old son who was 12 years old at the time, at the same time. Um, and, and pointed him out in the congregation. And I said, my son should be able to play in the park. 
And I had congregation members um, who were deeply offended by that. Mm. Deeply offended. Mm. And thought that I was, um, I was accusing them of something. Mm. And, and the best that I could say was, this is the gospel. <laughs> The accusation doesn't come from me, yeah. right? The accusation, yeah. any conviction that comes, comes from the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so I, I try to be really careful to make mm. sure that I don't, um, I don't conflate my own personal feelings beyond what the gospel does. But, mm. but I am very clear about how that gospel impacts me, and and to make statements like that um, can scare our predominantly white church, mm. right? Yeah. Um, it can, it can, um, you know, it can upset, you know, the, the families of police officers. It mm -hmm. can disturb the, the, the folks who are sitting judges and, and, and participants in the legal system. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how we navigate that, because we have powerful people in our churches. We yeah. do. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and that, um, and in our humanity, we have this this horrible tendency to to conflate um, presence with power, mm -hmm. and um, and we conflate that the gospel with our own personal needs mm -hmm. and our own personal desires and wants, mm -hmm. um, and we can have sitting on councils who. Um, who use that power in dangerous ways. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I would also say, and I can say this because um, he, he rests in peace, but I was told by a, um, that's while I was in training, um, that the greatest wisdom that he had for me was um, that his, his success in ministry was that he did not make waves. And I looked at him and I said, wow, that's not me. Yeah, that's not the Jesus face either. The beat <laughs> and said, I know. And I was like, well, okay then. Wow. Wow. As I sat there as a seminary student in front of him and, and, and it was, you know, hmm. that was the reality. Um, and so, yeah, when when you name your identity in in this place, it can be it can be a risk. Mm -hmm. It can be a personal risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is really good stuff. Um, is there anything else that these seminary students need to know about going out into the wherever they're going, organizations? Oh goodness, you know, I think that what what I want seminary students to know is that um, the system is not the people, not the system, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, our, our system is designed, um, lack of any better terminology, uh, for the single white man with a dog and a guitar, from college to seminary to the parish. Um, and, and that um, worked for a while. Um, that is not who is in seminary these days, for the most part. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe that that's a God thing. That's a God activity, mm. that that's not who's here mm. anymore. That, that's not the only people whom God is calling. And that yeah. if you are in the seminary and you are feeling that call and you are, are, are knowing that, 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 that God's presence is in you and God's voice is, is calling you, then, then you need to be affirmed by that and you need to hold, hold strong to that and hold firm to that because will beat you down. <laughs> the system will find ways to, 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 to destroy that, to, to, to completely um, minimize who and, and, and what you are. Mm -hmm. But that's not the people. There are, there are people 
people in the system. There are some who, who rec there are people within the system who will help you shape those gifts and form those gifts and and define those gifts and and move through those gifts and use those gifts. Yeah. Um, that's why you're encountering them. That's why God has placed you in relationship with them. That is why you are there. Um, and you have to trust that. Mm. You have to trust that. And whether you end up with a parish or a chaplaincy, an independent ministry start, or or going back to a lay ministry position formed with your theology is not time. This is not um, a waste of time. Yeah. This beautiful journey that God has brought you to and um, ready to use it. Yeah. And That's the God is using if it. Yes. Well, I thank you so much. I you're cutting out a little bit, um, but I am so glad for you. I just want to thank you, Priscilla, for who you are and your longtime friendship, and you're a beautiful human being. And I'm glad to know you, and I'm glad that 90 more people are going to know you now in this <laughs> class. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank right. you so much. Yeah, take Peace. care. All right, peace.